Good morning. Uh, this week, uh, different backdrop with the weather the way that it's been this week. I spent a little more time working from home, so uh, recording here instead of in my office at church. Uh, but regardless, we're going to continue on through the New City Catechism in our devotional series. Uh, last week, we talked about idolatry, what it is, how to deal with it to some degree, and how to, how to identify the idols in our own hearts. Uh, and this week, we kind of cap off the last two by, by asking, will God allow our disobedience and idolatry to go unpunished? No. Every sin is against the sovereignty, holiness, and goodness of God, and against his righteous law. And God is righteously angry with our sins and will punish them in his just judgment, both in this life and in the life to come. And Ephesians 5, 5 through 6 says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, we have spent some time looking at the idea of, of judgment in this life, that even for the believer, when we sin, there are consequences, and God disciplines those whom he loves, and he prunes, and he removes the parts of us that are not in line with his character in order that we might be more faithful followers of him. And so there's justice and judgment in this life as a result of sin. But there's also judgment in the life to come. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about this, and so I think this is a good week to, to address the idea of eternal punishment. Uh, when we think about hell, a lot of times we, we spend time arguing more about its existence. Is hell real? Does God actually punish in this way? And I don't really want to spend a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, so I want to consider hell kind of from two points. One, what is the nature of hell? And then what, what are some of the things that maybe we should learn because of the reality of eternal punishment? So the nature of hell. Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46 maybe are, are some of the most helpful in, in verses in clarifying the nature of hell. Um, we know it to be an eternal separation from God, and in, in that it is punishment. But there are a few other things that I think we want to draw out. First, it's a separation between the wicked and the righteous. In Matthew 25, 32, it says, Before him will, will be gathered all the nations. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And so it's a, a, something that will occur at the, at the final judgment that God will separate the righteous from the wicked. The wicked he will punish and the righteous will enter eternity with Christ. And Matthew 25, 41 points out the second thing about the nature of hell. It is an unending punishment. Verse 41, then he will say to those on the left, the goats, if you're looking at the, the passage in its entirety, then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So it's, it's an eternal thing. In the same way that life for the believer is eternal, punishment is eternal. It is an unending punishment. And then verse 46 of Matthew 25 highlights the final piece that I want to just mention here is that hell is just retribution against the sinful rebellion that we have against God. Verse 46 and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so the nature of hell, it is a separation uh, between people and God, specifically the wicked and God, but it's also a separation between the righteous and the unrighteous. It is an unending punishment, and it is just for God to punish in this way. And so we, we see the nature of this eternal punishment. And what should this punishment prompt in us? I remember years ago reading uh, Erasing Hell by Francis Chan and his, his opening to the book. He said, uh, if you are excited to read this book, uh, you're probably coming at it from the wrong attitude. 
Because what I'm trying to argue is that God will in fact punish people eternally. And that's not something that should excite us necessarily. And I, th that has stuck with me, but it also raises the question, if, if it's not to be celebrated necessarily, what should we learn? And so there are a few things that, that I think are important to learn from the doctrine of hell. Uh, some of this comes from Paul Tripp, who is a counselor, an author, and, and has written on this topic, and I think some of these are helpful. And so some of it comes from him, some from my own study, but what should we learn from the doctrine of hell? First, the doctrine of hell should produce grief. It should break our hearts that there are those who, who are living with and around us who are moving steadily towards a, a God separated eternal punishment, that these people will be separated from God for eternity, that they'll be removed from his presence. And, and we can't celebrate the reality of heaven without grieving over the reality of hell. It, it should produce grief in us for those who are not believers. The second, it should produce a kind of zeal. Um, in the same way that it produces grief, it should move us to action, to share the gospel, to share the good news of the saving grace of God. The only thing that, that brings us into relationship with him and guards us from this eternal separation. And so we should be interacting with people who don't know the good news. We should be making effort to, to know people who don't know God in order that we might share the good news of the gospel with them. Uh, Paul Tripp says it this way, day after day, you, you brush shoulders with people marching towards doom, and you've been sovereignly positioned by God to brush shoulders with them. Is your heart zealous to share the gospel? There's a Charles Spurgeon quote that, that has stuck with me over the years, and he says, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our ex exertions, and let no one go unwarned or unprayed for. And so the doctrine of hell produces grief, a sorrow over this reality, but also a zeal to share the good news that no one ought to experience it. And the doctrine of hell should produce thankfulness. Ezekiel eighteen twenty three says, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live. And so our, our thankfulness should not be that people are going to hell, that people are going to experience this eternal punishment. We aren't to celebrate that, as Ezekiel 18 says, but we should be thankful that final justice is coming. There's a, a book called uh, Forgiveness and Justice that, that has been really helpful for me in thinking through this idea, but understanding that God will judge the sinner that justice is coming provides a sense of comfort in the here and now, but it also means that God sees your suffering. He, he sees the pain that is caused by sinful action, and he has an answer for it. And so there should be a thankfulness that there is a final justice, a final judgment in which God re fully rescues his people, fully redeems and restores the believer, um, and gives an answer and a, a judgment for the wickedness that will happen and has happened. And last, the, the doctrine of hell should produce a kind of prioritization. Uh, it, eternity reminds us of what is truly important. Uh, Frequently throughout the epistles, Paul reminds that we are to set our minds on things above. We are to look to eternity. We're to look to what is to come. In fact, his, his hope in the midst of suffering is eternal glory. And so eternity gives perspective and, and helps us prioritize how to live now. The psalmist says, teach us to number our days. When we meditate on the reality of heaven, 
and hell, eternal separation, we ought to rearrange our value system. It ought to shape how we live because it, it puts everything in proper perspective. Again, Paul Tripp, a believer who meditates daily on the doctrine of hell will invest much more in the kingdom of God than the kingdom of self. And so to, to sum up, hell is separation from God, from between the wicked and the righteous. It is an, an unending punishment, and it is just. And it should prompt in the believer a grief, a zeal to act and proclaim the gospel. It should produce thankfulness in us for what God will do in response to wickedness. And it should shape our perspectives and, and shape how we live because it changes our priorities when we, when we see the end. And so the doctrine of hell is contested. It is a difficult doctrine to get our minds around. It's even difficult as we contemplate what it means that God is good. Uh, and, and yet, we see it throughout Scripture again and again. And so it's not something we want to shy away from, but it's something we want to learn from.